Well, welcome, ladies and lady and gentlemen. It's a little quieter than the last session. Uh, just we uh, we ran through a couple things in the first session in, in track three. This is track three, uh, monitoring Linux with NRPE. And when we are done with this session, we're going to do a quick Q and A for you that weren't in the room, or those of you who weren't in the room the uh, the first session. Um, please wait. Just raise your hand when we do the question and answer session, so we make sure we get a microphone over to you, so that we get this. It's being recorded, so we make sure that we get both ends of the question and the answer on the recording. All right, well, with that, I want to introduce you to Mike Weber. Thank you. We're going to talk about NRPE, and what I want to talk about in this session is everybody says NRPE is so simple, and yet what you find is a lot of questions about NRPE, and that all relates to many of the variables. So what I'm wanting to do is walk through all of those variables to help people understand uh, where things are. Because it can be very confusing because of all of the options that are out there. And so that's what we want to do. So first of all, let's talk about some basic concepts. NRPE means that you must place an agent on the Linux box. So that agent is going to have a daemon that is listening on port 5666 so that communication can come from the Nagio server. So that's the first thing you have to understand is there's going to be an agent on that Linux box. Nagios is going to use one plugin, check underscore NRPE. Nagios is going to use that plugin to connect to the remote box to execute plugins locally. The plugins are going to execute locally on your client. What that means is you need to have the plugins on the client. So when you think about the client, the Linux box, not only need, does it need to have NRPE daemon, but it has to have the plugins that you want to execute or the scripts that you want to execute on the client. There are direct checks, checks, and indirect checks. So if we look at a uh, direct check, here's an example. Nagios connects to the remote box. Uh, you do have to configure that firewall if that firewall is an issue. And Nagios is just using check NRPE, connects up and says, OK, I'm supposed to run check users. It runs that plugin locally, collects the information, and returns it to Nagios. So the only plugin that actually executes on Nagios is check NRPE. All the rest of the stuff is going to happen on your client. Indirect checks are a little bit different. So what happens with an indirect check is that Nagios connects up to the client and executes a plugin like uh, check HTTP. In other words, it's going to connect up to another box to monitor that other box. This would allow you to have two different networks so that your client could be on two networks and you could be monitoring uh, based on multiple networks. So that's just the indirect concept. So those two are very possible, easily set up. So on the client, these are the things that we've got to have. We've got uh, the daemon, and that daemon is going to mean that you have a location for it on the server. You're also going to have your commands file. That's your nrpe.cfg. This file, text file, is going to have the commands that you're going to execute. So when Nagios connects up, goes through the daemon, comes to this commands file, and says, OK, I'm supposed to execute check users. Where's that command? Finds it in the list and executes it based on the information that you've provided in the file. So you can set up everything to run on the client. All your warning critical states, all your settings can be on that client in that config file if you wanted to, to be that way. And you also have to have those plugins. Uh, all of the plugins have to be on the client. Again, the server is only executing check NRPE and connecting to the client. Of course, the ha server has the host and service definitions in it. Okay, so that gives you the foundation. 
Now, the variables. And, and this, is a, this is a sad state in some ways uh, because with people wanting to implement NRPE, it can be very frustrating because they're not aware of these many variables. The first variable is how you install the agent. Of course, if you use the repository for CentOS, uh, Dagweirth, for example, uh, when you install that RPM Forge, when, when you install that, it's going to install it in a different location than Ubuntu, a different location than SUSE Enterprise. And this can be very frustrating. If you take the agent from Nagios XI, and I'll show you that agent in a second, when you use NRPE in Nagios XI, it says, hey, you've chosen this distribution. Here's the agent you should install. That will very likely be in a different location than if you use the Ubuntu repository. So this is where the confusion comes, is trying to figure out where does all this stuff go? It's, it's not that it's not on your system. It's just where did it land? How do I find it? Uh, so the other option is to compile it. So for the systems that I run in my, my test environments and, and one of the recommendations that I make for a lot of companies is you can solve this whole problem by just saying, okay, I'm going to compile everything. I'm going to do everything the same way. Then you find everything in the same location. The files are the same. They all look the same. Everything's the same. All your configurations are synchronized in that way. But I see a lot of organizations that have multiple Linux distributions and install it in different ways. It makes the troubleshooting a nightmare. If your administrators, they, they go to an Ubuntu server and they have to think, okay, where is that nrpe.cfd? They go to a CentOS box and it's in a different location. So this is one of the decisions you're gonna have to make. The daemon that you install may also be different. Uh, I've seen some differences with SUSE Enterprise daemon versus other uh, daemon installs. So when you pull things from distribution, you have to be aware that there could be some differences that your NRPE is going to function a little bit differently. The nrpe.cfg file, which is the commands file, is likely to look different. That shouldn't bother you too much because you're going to be able to create your own commands, but it may look different. It may have different examples. Some of those configuration files may allow arguments. Others may not. So this is something that we have to talk about is this whole argument thing because that's a whole nother level of frustration for people. Where your NRPE daemon is located can be different. So it can be found, if you compile, it's going to be found in USR local Nagios bin. If you use another method, it's going to be found in USR S bin. So everything can be in a different place. And you have to be aware, now if your organization only uses Ubuntu servers and you're managing them, then you could use a repository. Uh, you, you would just know that everything is in that location. But you do have to know those locations to be able to figure that out. And you can see the, the daemon config file. Uh, Ubuntu even has, why they do everything different, I'm not sure. So instead of Etsy Nagios, it's Etsy Nagios 3. So you just, again, have to be aware of all the differences. One good thing, this is maybe the only thing that's similar, is this config file, wherever you find it, this is the NRPE daemon file, it's all the same. Only have to modify the allow host line that's in red there. You can see I've got the local host and the IP address of the Nagios server. Uh, so this is what's going to allow Nagios to connect up to the daemon. So this is where you have to pay attention. Notice it's not separated by a comma. Separated IPs are separated by a space. If you had several Nagios servers that you wanted to monitor this box, you'd just separate those by a space. You can put as many IPs in here as you want. So this is basically how this is uh, set up. Now, 
Again, typically, this is going to be set up under the uh, zynet.d. It's in the etsy zynet.d directory. And so that super daemon is managing this. So you would restart the daemon, the super daemon, in order to see your changes in this config file. Um, so if it's not managed by zynet.d, then it's going to be managed by, it could be managed by uh, inet. So you, you got some differences here, too. Locations. Uh, again, these client variables, the locations. I want to show you a couple uh, options and, and uh, emphasize here. Uh, th these locations you can probably figure out uh, in time. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of a complete uh, uh, compile install and then also an example with Nagios XI. So I'll show you the example all the way through. But just to note, typically you're going to have etsy nrpe.cfg if you compile. If you use the XI agent, it's going to create a directory called nrpe. And this may throw you upside down. You're thinking, what in the world? But it's tied to this nrpe file by a line, which I'll show you. So again, the differences. When you look at the commands, the commands themselves have several options. Are you going to use arguments? When you see the one after don't blame NRPE, that means that you're going to allow arguments. So you can see ARG1, ARG2 at the end there. Those are arguments then. So you set your actual warning, critical states, your partitions, all of those specifics on Nagios, not on the client. If you don't use arguments, zero, then you can see the example, the warning and critical states are set on the client. So look for this line. This line is going to determine if you can use arguments or not. Now, if, if you say, OK, I want to use arguments, you can do both if you want to. But if the arguments are turned off, everything has to be locally on your client. Now, the advantage of that uh, if, you, if you just say, hey, I can't figure this, all, this stuff out, then do everything locally. Define it all locally. And you're going to find that it's easier to figure out until you figure out the arguments. So because on Nagios, the only thing you're saying is, for example, if you wanted to run uh, check users, there's check users. So on Nagios, all you're saying is run check on NRPE and run check users. That's all you're setting up on Nagios because all of your definition is on the, the client that you're trying to monitor. Plugins. Again, plugins can be in different locations. If you are using a 64-bit, you may find that uh, they're in a different location as well. The top line, USR local Nagios uh, libexec, is the default if you use XI agent or if you compile. Again, a good reason to find a pattern that works for you. Do all of your servers the same way. So let's go through, if, we were, if you were going to choose the option to compile, let's go through this process. Uh, because I've shown you that there's lots of options. And you're going to have to straighten that out somehow. Why would you look at compiling? Well, a couple reasons. Mainly. Everything is going to be in a consistent pattern, whether on Ubuntu, SUSE, CentOS. You're going to find your stuff in the same place. You're going to have the same plugins. You're going to have the same version. Now, remember, if you compile, you're going to be able to get the latest version. But if you pull from a repository, your SUSE repository may be a year behind the version that is able to be compiled. Your Ubuntu repository may be only three months behind. You're going to have differences. And some of those, those time periods can be extensive. And so you will have different versions. And this is going to cause you additional issues. Uniform troubleshooting. It's important that your troubleshooting for your administrators is uniform. 
They're just going to create all kinds of issues for them. If they have to go to each server, figure out the version, I mean, you might as well just make them a sheet and say, hey, this is where it is on this server, this is where it is on this server version. So, and the upgrades are going to be uniform. If you compile, then you can run that through all of them, and they're all doing it the same. Everything is synchronized. If you don't, then you're going to have those differences. So here's a simple uh, install script. A lot of people are a little bit of nervous about uh, compiling, but this is a simple script that just goes to SourceForge, pulls down the package, uh, uh, uncompresses it, uh, gets some dependencies with yum. Of course, this would be apt-get if it was Debian or Ubuntu, and then uh, compiles and sets up the, uh, the information. So this is a, a simple process. You can find these scripts online. Uh, this would be an easy thing for you to do to upgrade your system as well. So this is not that uh, complex. Same thing with your plugins. If you compile those plugins, you're going to place them in those typical locations. Uh, and you're, you're going to be good to go there. You'll have those standard plugins all ready to go. With NRPE, as, as I've kind of showed you here, one of the major things you have to think about is when you go on the Internet, you're going to pull up something with Google, you have to ask yourself the question, are these guys compiling? Is this illustration of compiling? Are they coming from a repository? What repository? Because that tutorial, that information you find, may not be useful for your setup because of the way they've got it going. And so that's a part of this advantage of compiling. So everything is going to be in those standard locations. These are the standard locations that you're going to find. Uh, your binary, your configuration file, uh, and your plugins. Everything is going to be placed in those typical locations. Now, if you decide to use the agent that is on XI, what are the differences? Because there are differences. If you download and compile, there is a difference if you go with the agent. Uh, first of all, you'll get this agent, and you'll go, and you can see the Linux agent. Now, this is a CentOS uh, example. And you will pull it down, and you will execute it and do a full install. So you can see it's going to do a full install of the agent. And it's going to go along and it's going to ask you the question, OK, what IP address should get access to this NRPE uh, daemon? And so that's the IP address you see in the example. You'll enter that. You could in enter in multiple IP addresses. So that's one thing that's different is the installation process is a little bit different. If you compile, you must go back and edit that NRPE file. If you use the agent, it's going to ask you for the IP. The other thing that's different is this include directory. You can see in red that there's going to be a line in the nrpe.cfg that says include a directory called nrpe. And there's a file in there called common.cfg. So it really doesn't matter where you place your commands and edit your commands because both files are going to pull in. But the common.cfg is placed there by Nagios because it's going to set up some automatic options that Nagi Nagios wants to, perform to provide through the wizard. Okay, So that's one thing that is also different from compiling is it may be a little bit disturbing that all of a sudden you see an NRPE directory and some other files. They're tied together, but this is so Nagios XI can set up some of those features. Here's that common.cfg. And if you look at that first line, for example, uh, the one in red, there's a command that's using the sudo command to look for uh, application, not applications, but daemons that start in that init uh, dire directory. So. This is something that Nagios has said, hey, listen, this is probably what people want to, to use when they go to the wizard. And so they're providing that foundation in this kind of file. So you'll see that this file is a little bit different than the examples that you see if you compile. Notice that many of these have the option for arguments. In other words, the specifics that you want to check are placed in Nagios not in 
on the client. So that's the arguments are going to be available here. When you look at this example, this again illustrates that nrpe.cfg file. You have the command, and then in the red, you have the actual service name. So if you are looking at the first example, check underscore hda1, that is your service that you're executing on Nagios. So that command is going to then be defined, and it gives you the path, check disk. That's the local plugin. Again, this is on the client. And then it gives all of the specifics, warning level, critical, and also to name that partition. So this is if you do not allow arguments. Notice the zero there. So you, if you do not allow arguments, then you must define everything on the client. If you do allow arguments, then you could actually define it on Nagios. And so in the second command down, you can see that it has arguments. And so all of those arguments for warning, critical states, partitions, that could all be placed on the Nagios server. Here's an uh, issue that I found with uh, SUSE Enterprise, which is um, if you use arguments, you, you have to be prepared. If you use these different distributions, you may see some differences. On CentOS, a dash A for the argument, and then your warning and critical in single quotes. Works fine in Nagios XI. Doesn't work with SUSE. Tells me that the binary is a little bit different. So you have to use a dash A argument for both warning and for critical state. All I'm saying is, again, because of the differences, just, you just have to be a little bit creative and try to figure out there may be a difference here, and so I'm going to have to make some adjustments. But this is one example. So what does this look like on Nagios Core? We've looked at Nagios XI. Nagios Core, uh, again, same kind of check. Here we're looking at two different examples. At the top, if we're not using arguments, again, check in RPE, exclamation mark, which separates the uh, plugin that you're going to execute on the remote box, checks users, check mail queue. That's all you have to do. So all of the information is on your client. If you're going to use arguments, then it looks different. Notice that you probably have to modify the command for check NRPE so that it will allow arguments. So the default command may have to be modified. So you can see in red, I've modified the name of the command and the specifics, warning level, critical level, and partition are placed here on Nagios. If in the top example, the dash C is the command that's going to execute. So if you want to use arguments, you have to use a dash A and then allow multiple arguments. So you're going to have to modify your command on Nagios core if you want to be able to execute those arguments uh, and place them on the Nagios system itself. The other thing to note here is you may have time differences. So here is a, a time of 60 seconds instead of the, the default So if you have to increase those limits. So you may have to create another uh, NRPE definition. But these are easy to create. Just put them in your commands.cfg. Uh, these files, these commands then, you could use uh, any way you want to. And you can use a combination. It don't, you don't have to be limited to one or the other. So if you look at no arguments, you can see there's a check NRP. That's the command name. That coincides with the check command. Check users with nothing, no arguments. What that means is all of the arguments are on the client. So the command that you define has everything. If you use arguments, and you can see there's the dash A, and we're going to use arguments there. And then you have your specifics of what you're going to check, 80, 90, and root partition. And then you've got the argument issue on your remote box. So that's, that's the difference that you're going to have to go with in your command definitions. There's going to have to be 
specifically um, different. Here's an example. You can see at the top there's a script. This is just a simple script, uh, advanced intrusion detection, which is looking to see if files have changed on your system. Okay, And it has, if you were going to use any script, you could define it on your client as this example, check age. So you can then set that up on your Nagios server, check NRPE, uh, exclamation mark, check age. So it's going to execute that script, whatever script you have, whether it's Perl or Bash or whatever it is, uh, all you have to do is define it like a, um, like a um, plugin and put it in that plugins directory. And it's going to work fine. So many organizations have scripts that they want to use. Somebody's built a script, and so it's a simple process to get those to work. Okay, so NRPE on XI. So what does it look like? So here you would go to the Linux server. Uh, that's, that's a wizard. Uh, here you select your distribution. And when you, this example is, uh, NR, is CentOS. And there you can see it says download the agent. So when I was talking about the agent from XI, this link will take you to a download that you can install on all of your CentOS boxes. So Again, that is an option that you can choose. There's also a link that provides you documentation, how to do it, where things will be. So again, this is to try to make this as easy as possible for you to install that agent on that remote box. You've got your server metrics, whatever you want. You can select what you want. You certainly want to sit here and you want to think about, is, uh, these, are these default settings? Uh, settings that will work well for our organization in our needs. Modify that to what you need and what will fit with your disk space, your memory, etc. You have services that you can monitor uh, with the XI wizard. And so these are services that are typically found in Etsy init.d. These are going to be daemons that start up, and so you can put those up above. And then processes, maybe your, your company is running applications on the server that you want to monitor, and you can put those in there as well. There's an example of some of the daemons that could be on uh, in Etsy, init.d. You'll set up in step four, how often you want this to happen. Step five, who's going to get notifications. Step six, you're going to set up just do I have service groups, host groups, and also who are the parents? Uh, what are the machines that are up above this if this would happen to go down? And then you complete that process. So that wizard is designed to work with the agent, but you can make modifications to this and you can use it with any of those agents that you choose out there. You just you have to know the location of stuff. And so you have to make some modifications. Are you using arguments? Are, are you not? There is another wizard, and this is called NRPE. So if you want to install the agent for Nagios uh, XI, uh, then you will use that other agent. And I'm giving you this, uh, these examples from uh, Nagios 2012. Uh, this NRPE agent then is going to allow selection. You can see there's multiple distributions. There's also some NetBSD and obviously Windows is not a Linux or Unix distri distribution. But you can add things because remember Windows does NRPE as well. So this is not going to ask you to install an agent. There is no agent. Uh, this is just if you wanted to add things to that particular uh, setup once the agent is installed. So again, you got to get the agent installed, uh, and then you can obviously add things to it. Now you can go to the CCM in Nagios uh, XI, and you can add those things manually if you want to. And then you can define all of those things as you need to. Question. Uh, I was curious, is there a benefit to allowing or disallowing arguments? Okay. 
The real issue about arguments is basically twofold. The primary issue is security. If you can execute arguments, somebody else might be able to execute arguments. Remember, you have an allowed host line, which is adding some security. This issue, most organizations say, hey, it's not an issue. It's on an internal network. We're not even using firewalls. If, you are, if this box is exposed to the internet, I'd give some serious thought to that option. If it's not, then yeah. The other aspect of that is Nagios XI wants to use arguments because in the, when you configure it, you are using boxes to put in those argument information. Um, so that's what, their, that's what their agent is set up. Not that you can't use XI without arguments, but so that's why. So it depends on kind of if, if you're using XI or core. Well, I you mean, can. I, I know it's not dependent on that, but yeah. if you're using XI, it, you probably should. Should is not the word um, because I've I've helped people set up Nagios XI and use no arguments. And the thing I like about that is, I basically I would say this is if you use XI and you get confused and it's all twisted, just make it simple. Go to the client, define everything. You have no arguments. It's easier to figure out. And once you get that going, then you can you can build off there. So XI will work either way. You just have to you know choose what makes most sense to you. Okay, question two. Yeah. If you do have multiple servers on a single IP that you need to access, uh, or or multiple machines uh, running uh, in RPE um, through a single WAN, is there a good way to do that? Um, I. I know the way that, I, that I've done it, but. So you're saying that you have two different boxes on the same IP? Is that what? Three on the same IP. So I haven't, I haven't you know, monitored that way. So what, what was your solution? Well, what I, what I did was in the NRPE config on each server, I set up uh, one to run on 5666, one 5667, one 5668. And then I set up port forwarding Different. on my firewall uh, to accept uh, <laughs> yeah. connections on, on those ports and then forward them to the correct server. And then I set up three check NRPE uh, <laughs> commands in the Nagios box to yeah. check on 5666, 5667, 5668. So, yeah, that would work. Uh, and you understand it's kind of agony to have to set it up that way. So. But it would work, yeah, yeah. And so using, and there you have to have a firewall to be able to do the port forwarding. Okay, so everything has to be on a different port. What kind of servers? Um, okay. I know. I I understand exactly. I've I've worked on those Macs, and that's uh, interesting. Any other questions? Maybe I'll ask this question. Um, you guys probably have all had some kind of relationship with NRP. What are the biggest issues that you find with NRP? What are, what are your frustrations with that whole concept? You got. You got to wait. There you go. As far as setting up, uh, like you were saying, whenever you s use the um, compile yourself or run the uh, RPM or something like that, mm -hmm. if you decide what I uh, initially figured out uh, after much trial and error is if you originally compile or if you originally use the RPM you know, from the EPL or wh um, um, whatever, uh, it puts everything in a completely different place. So if you originally compile and then you go, oh, I'm, I think I'm going to save myself a little bit of time and I'm going to run an RPM, it expects everything to be in a completely different place. And suddenly what you thought you just installed, you can't find, you don't know where anything <laughs> is. Yep. Uh, and so if you initially compile, compile everything. 
Yep. Uh, I, I found that that has solved a lot of the configuration. Yep, and that's absolutely problems. it. Is everything you do, I think, has to have a pattern. You can figure out your pattern, do what you want, but do everything the same way. And I think you touched on another good thing is if you compile or if you install via uh, RPM or deb file, and then you do the opposite, and so you got both, you better clean it up. Because if you don't clean it up, it's going to be a curse for you forevermore. Uh, and even you could have two binaries named NRPE on the same box as in different locations. So you could have conflicts. Uh, there's, there's just lots of things that can go wrong if you start installing two different ways on the same box. So. Anybody else? What are the kinds of problems that you face with NRPE? No, no problem. Is it, is it is it as easy as everybody says? Is I mean, have you not faced any of these issues? The configurations, uh, just trying to figure out where everything is, like you were yeah. saying, uh, with just uh, the web uh, telling you where to go and trying to decipher, okay, did this person actually install it from a RPM or compile it? Uh, the second thing is, especially on a Mac, uh, because the companies that, that I do work for are st strictly Macintosh, so we're monitoring only Macintosh from a Linux box, uh, is that the check disk uh, command is completely different. So uh, it is looking for disk one S one or S2 instead of HD1 or, or HD1 right. or you know whatever. Your Ethernet cards are called something different. Yeah, right. Your yeah. memory Maybe. is really hosed. Uh, actually, no. The the memory checks the um, the disk was the big one. The disk. Okay. So uh, what what OS Mac OS? I have it installed uh, all the way from 10.5 to 10.8. The thing that I found was. To working on some of those Macs was the memory, the, the information they wanted for memory. I had to write scripts on their boxes to get the information because none of the plugins would work by default. Were you, um, I, can, I used the Mac port um, installation of NRPE, so I don't know if that maybe had okay, been Okay, so I, I actually wasn't able to use NRPE because they couldn't install NRPE, it was SS. SNMP, so that's right, I forgot about that. Yeah, so it's SNMP that if you do access it, the memory is different and you have to write a script for it to pull it out of it a different way. It's there, but um, the information uh, it does, does not work with those. And ac plugins. Actually, I do vaguely remember uh, on one particular server where we were having uh, a memory leak on, we were trying to, to troubleshoot that, and I think I did have to go in and modify some of the it's the command the is a little check, bit or different. write a Perl script yeah, I, I don't yeah, remember what yeah. I did okay yes oh just a quick question um, do you always recommend using NRPE when monitoring Linux boxes or are there cases where you just use SNMP or some other technology it, it's just really up to the organization now a lot of people like SNMP or a lot of people like NRPE. Um, NRPE is what's commonly referred to as about the easiest way to monitor Linux. But if your organization has the ability with SNMP, there's nothing wrong with that. There, you don't lose anything by, by doing SNMP or doing passive checks that were coming from your Linux boxes. I mean, there's just there's a lot of different ways. Um, it kind of depends on the skills of your administrators, if, if they're low-level skills, you're probably going to want to start with NRPE because it is a little bit easier. If they have SNMP skills and the organization wants to do that, there's nothing wrong with that because you can do all the same stuff. There's three or four different ways you can do the stuff. So. Thanks. Yeah.
Okay, give you a couple of more minutes and then uh, you'll be out of luck. Then you'll be at lunch is what you'll be. Ten minutes. So let's just change it. What, what are some of the issues that even outside of uh, NRP that you're having with your Linux boxes? What kind of problems are you wrestling with currently? or decisions that you're trying to make? Yes. Um, well, I took over a Nagio setup that someone else had done, so that's a challenge in itself. But um, we have some, we have a firewall and some of the tests are passive through NSDA. We have those that are outside the firewall are NRPE. And then there's a whole nother set that are checked by SSH. So it's all over the map. We're trying to figure out consolidating that, the best way to do it, probably be my biggest challenge. Yeah, so the passive and the SSH you're doing because of the firewall, I assume. Mm -hmm. And if you can't modify that firewall, um, you have a number of passive options. I mean, it, it probably makes sense to consolidate either passive or SSH because you can probably do both of those uh, depending on um, what, what you're executing on those clients. But you've got a couple issues to think about. One, if your Nagios server has got lots of resources, then you can do those active checks. But if it was low on resources, you would think more in terms of passive checks because that's going to save you some time. So the other thing is passive checks are always more complex than setup than active checks because you just have a couple more layers where you can make mistakes. They save you a lot of resources and they work great, but there are more places that you can fail. You can make a mistake. Once you've got them set, you're okay. Uh, but I would consolidate your SSH and passive checks to go one way or the other uh, that way. Your active checks on your local network, I mean, you could turn those into passive, but um, you're making a lot of work for yourself. Passive is a lot of work. Uh, it works great in the end, but it is a lot of work. So that would be a, a, an issue. And also, the, um, a lot of the machines that do the passive checks or I mean that it gets the passive checks from, they run SSH to other machines that they're connected <laughs> to. So there's there's a lot of layers to it. Uh, I see, yeah. And when they connect up to another box via SSH, is that through another firewall? Is it, uh, do we have multiple no, firewalls? No, just, just the one firewall. Okay, so all of those that are in each location, I would consolidate those to do those one specific way just because it would be easier troubleshooting because you have every patterns. Always, I always think about patterns and for your administrators, patterns so that you can, if you had to, you could write up a document and say, hey, everything's here. And that's the problem when you have different things is people just go in circles wasting time trying to find stuff. So those patterns are important. It's job security. That's where it is. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, how do you deal with um, security whenever you're going through this? I know that the NRPE has the only allow hosts, mm -hmm. um, but is that secure enough? If, if it's accessible to the internet, I'd say no. I mean, you've got to obviously have a firewall. Uh, so th there's two layers. Um, I think that if your Nagio server is accessible from by the public, you're going to have to consider some, some additional things. One of the things that um, I teach in the classes, which most people don't like in the advanced Nagios class is, um, um, oh, now I lost it, um, mod security. 
So mod security is an application firewall. So if you have a IP cables firewall, anything can come through those ports. You could send anything you want through port 80, 55666, whatever. With an application firewall, it goes through and it allows certain things through that firewall. So it's a whole nother layer. Now, mod security is not easy. It's not fun to play with, but it is very effective in, in terms of protecting a box uh, based on those ports. So an application level firewall is gonna be an important feature if you see your Nagios box being attacked. Now, if it's Nagios, you really have to get serious because if they own your Nagios box, they own your network. If it's a client, I mean, it's, it is a serious thing as well, but it's not as catastrophic as your Nagios box getting compromised. So application level firewall, if the public is gonna access that, uh, because you'll see that they're hammering on that all the time. You can't even go up. You know, everybody knows anything on the public network is gonna get hammered. So have, have you done anything different to protect those boxes? Uh, through our firewalls, I set up a rule that says uh, this port can only be accessed from this IP address right. and exclude all others. Right. Um, but the other than that, that's all. Uh, oftentimes on boxes that have public access, I'll put on uh, aid so that it will tell you if any file has been changed on that server and I'll put it on a cron job. Every four hours it will run and if it sees something, it comes up in Nagio and says, hey, somebody's changed something. Um, the other thing is uh, not only aid, but rootkit hunter. So it's checking for rootkits. Uh, you want to know if those things have happened, and so that's another thing that you could do is monitor your file system to make sure that it helps you sleep at night. How effective it is, I mean, it, it does work, but anything to help you sleep at night makes a lot of sense, especially when you got people banging away at it. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, two minutes left. You got another question? Okay, well, thank you for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.